God's problem, the end of Christianity. This issue is often labeled as one of the strongest objections to the Christian faith out there. There are countless atheists, skeptics, and unbelievers that have left Christianity precisely because of this difficult topic. If there is a loving God, why is there so much evil and suffering in this world? Well, we've got two great speakers that are going to help us tackle this topic. The first one is considered the leading strategist in evangelism in the United States of America. He's the author of several uh, books, including The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask With Answers. Uh, he's been a longtime ministry partner to Lee Strobel. Please welcome Mark Middleburg. And of course, our very special guest. He's the professor of mathematics at Oxford University. He's one of the strongest defenders of the faith in the world today, a prolific author, a prolific debater who's challenged some of the most well-known atheists and skeptics in the world today. He speaks Russian, English, French, and German. And he has been so kind and gracious just to join us at our conference today. Please welcome Dr. John Lennox. All right, well, you know, this is a topic in every survey, in every poll that's ever done of believers, uh, this is always the first thing that pops up. If there is a loving God, why, why is there so much evil and suffering in, in this world? Mark, would you agree that this is one of the strongest objections to Christianity out there today? Absolutely, I, I think it's the hardest question uh, and as an apologist, when I go out and speak, you know, m most topics, you give an answer and you, you, you feel like you've got something you can say that makes everyone feel, you know, confident and this is true. With the problem of pain and suffering, the problem of evil, it's, it's hard to say anything that's going to make us feel good about it. And, you know, I, so I, I kind of like to lower the bar of expectation and say, you know, th there's nothing that's going to solve this. But I do think Christianity, I think the Christian worldview has the best answer, the best response to it. You know, that's, that's an interesting point. Dr. Lennox, do you think this is, is this a Christian problem specifically to Christianity? Does uh, suffering and evil, co can suffering and evil coexist with a Christian God specifically? I agree with Mark that this is the hardest problem we face. But I think it's a hard problem for atheists as well as for Christians because suffering is not something only experienced by the Christian community. It's experienced by everybody. And I think that there's no easy solutions, but there's a way in to deal with enough that we can, in one sense, come to terms with it with some kind of intellectual honesty. The atheist solution, I think, is totally unsatisfactory for many reasons, which we'll go into. But I think it's worth saying that there are two problems we're talking about. There's the problem of natural evil, pain, cancers, tsunamis, all that kind of thing which are not, at least at first sight, caused by humans. And then there's the problem of moral evil, the bad things that human beings do to one another. So there are two problems. But there are also two perspectives, and that's why it's complex. Let me put it this way. Cancer looks very different to a young woman who's just been told she has three months to live and to the professor of oncology who's treating her. He sees the suffering. He's outside it. She experiences the suffering. And therefore, 
I know in an audience like this, there will be people sitting there with us who are really going through it. They're experiencing suffering while the rest of us watch it. And therefore, there's not only an intellectual side, how do we cope with the problem, the question, there's a pastoral side. How do we show people a way to come to terms with often irreversible situations? And we need to bear that in mind as we talk about it, I think. Well, of course, the philosopher Epicurus really put it this way. Either God wants to abolish evil and cannot, or he can and does not want to, or he cannot and does not want to. If he wants to but cannot, he's impotent. If he can and does not want to, he is wicked. But if God both can and wants to abolish evil, then how comes evil in the world? So Epicurus really put three assertions, one of which must be false. He's, he claims, God is all-powerful, God is all-loving, there is suffering. Mark, which one of these is false? Well, I think God can have another reason for allowing, allowing suffering. Um, I believe that God wanted to create beings who truly could love him. And it's often been said, but it's true, that love is always voluntary. Love cannot be forced. God wanted to create beings who could love him, but that meant he had to create us with the ability not to love him. And so in that uh, potential for turning away from God, he didn't create evil, he didn't cause evil, but he created a situation where free beings could turn away from him and disobey him, and of course that's what we did. So I think this, uh, the way it was posed, misses the fact that God might have another reason to allow evil, and that is because he wanted to create free beings who could really love him, but who also then had the freedom to disobey, and uh, we disobeyed, and that brought evil into the world. Uh, Dr. Lennox, is, is that r really the trade-off, a free will for the presence of evil and suffering? The free will question is utterly fundamental. Let me perhaps put this a slightly different way. I see many of you are college students, and that delights me. And I remember when I was a student about a hundred years ago, <laughs> I can remember sitting up at night and arguing, surely a good God could, would, should, and all this kind of stuff. Now you've all done that argument. Have you ever got to a satisfactory solution of it? And I discovered I hadn't. Nobody appears to have. And then I started to think a little bit more and ask myself the question I get asked all the time, could God not have made a world in which there was no moral evil and no pain? The answer is, of course he could. That may surprise you. Indeed, we can make such worlds. They're robotic worlds and virtual realities. A robot cannot sin, but I wouldn't want a robotic wife. I mean, imagine coming home to a wife who'd got an iPad here, and there was a thing, kiss, and you press the button, you get a kiss. It wouldn't be very exciting. It would have no meaning. Now, let's put that into perspective. If you want to exist in a world in which there's no pain in existence, you would cease to be human. There are no humans in a world in which there's no pain and evil. Because the thing that distinguishes humans according to scripture, and it's vastly important, is that we are made in the image of God. And we have certain parameters of freedom. The Genesis story is so relevant, and I may say a bit more about that this evening, but the idea that they were allowed to eat of all trees, but one was forbidden. If they couldn't eat of that tree, that would be meaningless. So they had the capacity to do it, but not permission to do it. And in that is constituted what it means to be a human being. 
You're able to say yes or no. You see, there's no love in a robotic world. And often the comeback, if I may just make one more comment there, is, but didn't God take a risk doing that? Well, of course he did. Don't you take a risk having children? I remember the first child that arrived, a little girl, and I was holding her in the hospital, and I thought, you know, you're a lovely little baby, but you could grow up to reject me. Why have children then? Well, we all know why. Because the risk is worth taking because of the value of the relationship. And so it seems to me that Epicurus and people who followed him, like Bertrand Russell and so on, have just not understood. And I think C.S. Lewis is right when he says this is the best defense because it allows us to have a world in which there are people made in the image of God, rational beings capable of a relationship. There would be no love for God if we hadn't the capacity to say no. Mark, other than free will, do you think there would have been any other trade-offs uh, if, um, if, if there was no evil in, in suffering in the world? The consequences of, of God removing all evil and suffering, is it just tied to free will or are there other things involved as well? Well, I, I think the cause is what I already said, that the, he gave us freedom and we... Uh, abused that freedom and brought pain and suffering into the world. Um, but that doesn't mean God can't use that. And of course he can and does use suffering. I think of the passage where Joseph, uh, after being sold into slavery and suffering for many, many years, uh, met with his brothers finally at the end of the story. And he says, you know, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And so, and of course, Romans 8, 28 says that God, you know, can work all things together for good, will work all things together for good uh, for those who love and serve and follow him. So I don't think that means or implies necessarily that God wanted those bad things to happen or certainly that he caused them, but that he brings good out of them. I think of uh, when I was first in ministry at uh, Willow Creek in Chicago, we had a guy on our team who we had trained in evangelism, and he had a very difficult call. Uh, he was visiting a guy in the hospital who had terminal brain cancer. And he was angry, he was shaking his fist, he, he was you know, distraught, he knew his life was coming to an end. Uh, my friend Ron lovingly shared the gospel with him and just patiently put up with his anger and just tried to help him to see that even though his physical life was coming to an end, that there was potential for spiritual life. And to just make a long story very short, this man ended up not only trusting in Christ before he died, but literally in a prayer together with my friend Ron, he thanked God for brain cancer. And he said, I thank God that you did what it took to wake me up in time so that even though this short life now is gonna, gonna end, I have all of eternity to be with Christ, to know, you know the benefits of you know, all of what heaven entails. He thanked God for his brain cancer and then he died of it. So again, I'm, I'm not saying brain cancer is good, I'm saying it's bad, but God can bring good out of it and I think he's wise and amazing in how he's able to do that. Dr. Lennox, can suffering really be a positive thing. Some skeptics say it would be really glib, I think, to suggest that. I wasn't suggesting it was a good thing, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, so there, there are atheists that, that really, no, that, um, that really take issue uh, with, the, um, with the argument that positive results can come from. Oh yes, they do, so. but Mark isn't suggesting that. He's saying something enormously important. Granted the suffering exists, then we see these examples of God doing something with it. But I understand this, this objection um, very well because can suffering do any positive good? Well, ask a football player. You know, those big chaps that play this crazy game called American football. Do you know that game? 
By the way, I once watched that game, and I was with somebody whose name was on the Hall of Fame, and he was trying to explain to me what the game was all about. So after an hour, he said to me, do you understand American football? I said, sure, I know exactly what it is. He said, what is it? I said, it's a series of prayer meetings interrupted by war. <laughs> but that's just a little aside. It's a good description. Yeah. These guys will put up with tremendous pain to develop their bodies and so on. And we recognize that as good. The fact that my body has built in pain recognition mechanisms is very important. Otherwise, people who lack it put their hand in the fire, they don't feel anything, and their hand is burned. We can accept that. The problem comes where the pain and the suffering seem to be overwhelming. That's the problem. Now, I've been in Auschwitz many times. And I've wept every time. I have many Jewish friends. I have many Polish friends who weren't Jewish but whose relatives suffered. And you think in Ukraine of the Holodomor. These things are overwhelming. And Stalin and the Gulag and so on. These things are so overwhelming that we cannot get our heads around it. And I have every sympathy with many of my friends who say, look, okay, you can point in science and in the world to beautiful things, beautiful mathematics and evidence of a designing intelligence, but please don't talk to me about a personal God of love in the light of the mess the world is in. And I understand why they reject God. But, now here's a bit of logic that seems to me to be enormously important. I've sat with people who are just overwhelmed with the pain. And they say, sorry, but there isn't any God. So I say, okay, there isn't any God then. Now, you're rejecting him because... You think suffering is evil. Would you mind telling me where you get the concept of evil from? And then I quote Dostoevsky, Yesli Bogan yet to volume. If God does not exist, everything is permissible. Now this is extremely important. That if you remove God from your worldview, it changes ultimately concepts of good and evil. And Richard Dawkins is a very good example of this because he says that the universe we observe has precisely those properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA just is and we dance to its music. Now this is immensely important. You get rid of God, you become an atheist. You now follow atheism to its logical conclusion, and its logical conclusion is good and evil don't exist. Well, then why talk about a problem of evil? There's a deep, deep inconsistency here, you see. And Dawkins recognizes it and doesn't really know what to do about it. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what he does because I've written a book about it. It's called Gunning for God, where I go into these things a little bit more. So what happens is they remove good and evil. So they have to shut up. There's no point in talking about evil if we're just dancing to the music of our DNA. If the man who shot those people in the church in Texas last week is only dancing to the music of his DNA, then who could blame him? There's no morality. So... We need to go on the offensive, pointing out that atheism has no solution. Now, the final point there is this. My atheist friends often say, I've solved the problem. I'm intellectually satisfied. And I say, what do you mean solved? You may have an argument that satisfies you intellectually. It doesn't satisfy me. But listen, you haven't got rid of the suffering. It's still there. You haven't removed it. In fact, you could have made it 10,000 times worse 
Because by removing God from the picture, you've removed all hope. And that's something we may need to explore a little bit more as we go further. If I could just add an illustration, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about C.S. Lewis in front of a man who sat under his teaching. But uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, was an atheist. We all know him as an, a, Christ, a Christian apologist. He wrote Mere Christianity. He wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. Um, a lot of people forget he was an atheist, and one of I think probably the main reason he gave for being an atheist is this very issue that there, you know, there couldn't be a loving God, a powerful God, and the existence of evil. Therefore, there is no God. Until he started to realize what Dr. Lennox just said. He, he said, "What is this thing I speak of? You know, called evil. What, how would I know what evil is unless there's some good standard by which to measure evil?" He said, how, how would you know what a crooked line was unless you had a sense of what a straight line is? And he began to realize that atheism was too simple and that the very fact that people are raising these objections tells you that intuitively they know there's a problem and things aren't the way they're supposed to be, which is exactly what the Christian worldview says. And Lewis, through realizing that and rethinking and saying, how do I know there's evil? I know there's evil. He began to realize there must be an objective good standard. There must be a God. And that was a major part of what turned this atheist C.S. Lewis into the apologist and Christian and disciple C.S. Lewis. This is, this is really his testimony. And I think it, it's helpful to remember when people raise the problem of evil, they're really giving you an opportunity to talk about evidence for God seen right in that problem itself. Well, in, in addition to C.S. Lewis, of course, um, for a lot of people, this is a, this is a major, um, major um, article of uh, uh, prevention, that can, that a major roadblock that they can't, uh, they can't cross. Um, of course, as Bobby mentioned earlier today, Charles Templeton, um, for him, uh, evil and suffering was the reason uh, he left the faith and he famously said that, you know, no evil, no intelligent human being can believe in a loving God in, in, this, uh, in this world. Uh, Dr. Lennox, you're an intelligent person. Um, how That's an understatement. <laughs> Uh, how would you how would you respond to uh, to Charles Templeton? I would want to, I would want to know what actually makes the man tick, because that sounds an impressive objection, but it's a wild generalization, and they worry me. No intelligent person. He knows full well that all down through history, some of the most intelligent people have been believers in God. So he's simply making a wrong assertion, which makes me wonder whether he has really interacted deeply enough with people who not only have thought about suffering, but have been through it and, and, and come to terms with it. You see, I'm being careful for a very good reason. There are no simple answers here. There are no simplistic answers here. And every person is different. And when I'm faced with the question, how would you answer a person who says X? It's usually phrased as an intellectual question that requires information, but it's a personal question. And therefore, you often have to answer the questioner and not so much the question. And that becomes much more difficult. And my usual tactic in that situation is to do a lot more listening than talking. People, people are hurting and they need to articulate that hurt. And often it lies much deeper down than they themselves realize. And there's no generic answer, that's what troubles people. They come up with these questions. I've got a friend and he's an atheist and he says X, Y, and Z. And they expect people like Mark and myself to come out with a generic answer that will solve it and they'll go back and that'll be it. That never happens. 
because most of these things are usually only worked out through deep relationships. And instead of trying to force some kind of answer into people's minds, I like to talk about what it is that really upsets them and where the difficulty lies. And listening to them changes the dynamics and the quality of the relationship. So that's not an answer, but it's the way I'd approach it. I couldn't agree more. Um, I have a chapter about the problem of evil in my book, The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask, which is out With here. With answers. Huh? With answers, yeah. I thought I should put some answers in there. But I, I start by talking about an experience when my daughter, Emma Jean, was four years old. And uh, we were, uh, we'd bought her some brand new tennis shoes, and she was so excited about them, you know, her beautiful new tennis shoes. And so she wanted to go out and walk. And we were on the sidewalk in front of our house, and she went running along, and there was a little place where the cement was a little uneven, and she caught the edge of her brand new tennis shoes and tripped and fell and got hurt, and she's crying. And I just remember her saying, why did this happen to me? Why did, and she, she was asking the why question. Now, can you imagine if I would have said, well, let me explain to you why. These are new tennis shoes. They're not broken in yet. The concrete's uneven. Um, we live in a fallen world uh, <laughs> to a four-year-old. She was asking the why question, but what she needed was a hug and love and reassurance. And I think sometimes people mouth the question, but it's not really a question at all. It's they're hurting, and they're saying, why, why God, why? And what they most need from us as, as Christians is Christian love and comfort and a hug and maybe just to sit and hold their hand and be quiet. So I think I really agree with that, and I think it's really important. I also want to shift over. It's interesting you brought up uh, Templeton because uh, my ministry partner of 30 years is Lee Strobel, and I think you mentioned that. Uh, Lee and I write together and speak together and do conferences together and so forth. Um, for his book, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend The Case for Faith, he interviewed Templeton, went to his home in Toronto, and he raised the very issue and said the same things you just said. I can't believe in a God that would allow a, a, a starving woman in Africa and her baby you know, to suffer. And uh, so Lee kept talking to him. And, uh, you know, this Templeton had been Billy Graham's preaching partner at one time, but then had lost his faith. So along the way, Lee brings up, he says, what about Jesus? What do you think about Jesus? And John Templeton started, or Charles? John. Charles, Charles Templeton uh, began to say, oh, Jesus, he was the wisest man who ever lived. He was wonderful. He, you know, he just super, superlative over, you know, over and over about how wonderful Jesus is. And then he got emotional, and he began to weep. And this man who wrote his book, it's called My Farewell to God, wept in front of Lee saying, I miss Jesus. Jesus is so wonderful, and I miss him. And he just lamented the distance between him and God and between him and Jesus. And I just I bring that up to say there's more to the story sometimes when people raise these objections. And sometimes we need to help people look at Jesus anew. Uh, it helps me that Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. I think it's John 16, 33. He, and, and it helps me to know that the Christian worldview accounts for and acknowledges evil. You know, there are religions that deny evil. And I just, I could never... Put, throw my mind out and my experience out to follow one. I follow Jesus who said, in this world you're going to suffer, not if, when. But then he said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And Templeton, I think, recognized that distance. And I'll just add that on his deathbed, and this is from his wife, he sat up in bed and he said to his wife, he said, do you see them? And she said, see who? He said, angels, they're, they're coming to take me home. All of a sudden, he became, apparently, a believer, at least a, he, he had a very spiritual experience on his deathbed. It was written about in the papers in Toronto. And uh, I don't know, you know, where he, the whole story of him and God. 
But I just want to say, a lot of times people who shake their fists at God, you know, the old cliche is if you turn, turn away God, it'll make you bitter, or you can turn to him and it'll make it better. And I don't mean it makes all the suffering go away, but it's better to go with him. Better to turn to Jesus who said, take heart, I have overcome the world. And uh, one last thing on this, I like what Peter Kreeft says. He says, ultimately, the answer to the problem of evil is not an answer. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus. Nobody suffered like Jesus suffered. I mean, yeah, other people were crucified, but the Holy Son of God was shamed. He, he, he took on the worst kind of uh, suffering and torture, but more than that, he took our sins, and he wants to walk with us. He understands. He's a God who can empathize with us, so it's better to turn to him and let him walk us through it, and that will help make it better than it would have been. Um. I'm just curious, is, is this a question that comes up often uh, in your evangelism experience, Mark? Absolutely. And, and I mentioned in this book the questions Christians hope no one will ask. We did a survey through the Barna organization. We asked, we called a thousand of you, a thousand Christians all over North America. And we said, you know, if you're in a situation, let's say it's Thanksgiving coming up and you're with your skeptical Uncle Bob, we all have one of those, don't we? Someone in the family who ridicules our faith, doesn't believe it, doesn't, maybe not in the family, maybe it's a neighbor, friend, co-worker, classmate. But anyway, we said, when you're with that person, what are the questions you most hope they won't raise because you feel inadequate or unprepared to answer it? The number one question was the problem of evil, the problem of pain and suffering. And I think we see that wherever we do Q&A, that's the top issue. I come to this country quite frequently, or used to at least, and if I were to choose the top topic that I'm asked to speak on, it's this one. And I'll never forget 9-11 just a few years ago. I happened to be in Manhattan, and I suddenly got a phone call from Columbia University <coughs> asking would I be prepared to talk that evening on the topic, the loud silence. Where is God? And I just was sitting in my hotel overlooking ground zero. So I agreed to do it. And as preparation, I listened to and watched on television the reading of the names. And what struck me listening to that was very moving. In the whole two or three hour service, there wasn't one hint of atheism. There were many assertions of faith in God, and some of them were very poignant, like a little boy saying, happy birthday, daddy. It was his dad's birthday, and he had died in one of the Twin Towers. And I went up that evening, and I told all the students that they allowed it outside, I think for the first time, on the steps of Columbia University, where all the students meet, in the darkness. And we were looking down over Manhattan, and the light columns shining into the sky where the Twin Towers had been. It was a tremendous opportunity, and you can see it online on the veritas.org. It was recorded. And again and again, and I'm just thinking, UC Davis, I think I did it just down the road, Cornell, and so on and so forth. Because this question matters to people. Now, if I may, I'd like to comment on the sheer importance of what Mark has just said. That the answer is not an intellectual argument as much as it is a person. Where people get into difficulty is this. They argue and they reason and they discuss, as I mentioned earlier, but they're never happy. And why is that? Because when they look out on the world, they see a mixed picture. Now, what do I mean by that? They see evidences of beauty and goodness and love and affection. And they see barbed wire and bombs and napalm. It's a mixed picture. And therefore, we've got to face that it's a mixed picture. 
and we find the philosophical questions almost impossible to give a satisfactory answer to because they don't remove the mixed picture. And when mathematicians are faced with difficult questions they can't solve, they have a way of approaching it. They say we're asking the wrong question. And so I have a different question that I put to people on this topic. Granted that the picture is mixed, there is good, there is evil, horrible evil. Is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God whom we could trust with that? That's a huge question. And the answer to that is, there is. I'll never forget being in one of the largest synagogues in the world. And I was with a Latin American Jewess who was trying to find her identity. And there was an exhibition of the feasts of the Lord, starting with Passover and ending with the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the middle, I hadn't noticed it, there was a doorway, Arbeit macht frei. It was a, a montage of Auschwitz. And when we got there, I was trying to translate from Spanish, translate the Yiddish into Spanish, and my Yiddish isn't wonderful. But she was following, and when she got to this doorway, she just put her hands out wide, touched each side of the door, and she says, and what does your religion say to this? And there was dead silence. And I thought, what do I say, Lord? What I said was this. I said, you know, I wouldn't insult your memory of your relatives who perished in the Holocaust by offering you a trivial answer. But you've heard me mention, and I said, this is gonna be so difficult for you, but you want to know what I think? I said, just try and come with me. You've heard me say, because I'd said it in connection with the festivals, that Jesus, Yeshua, was the fulfillment of the Passover and so on. I said, you know about Yeshua? And he, she said, yes. I said, now this is gonna be so hard for you. But it's, you'll have to listen if you're to make any sense of my response to your question. He claimed to be God, God incarnate. And you know he died in a cross and she still stood making a cross with her two hands. She said, yes. I said, why do you think God's on a cross? What does that show us? I said, at least it shows me that God did not remain distant from the problem of suffering, but himself became part of it. And as I said that, the tears just erupted from her eyes. And she said words I shall never forget. She said, why has no one ever told me that about my Messiah before? The answer is a person, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason I can cope with, in a sense, the ragged edges, the barbed wire and the beauty, is that I think there's enough evidence to trust God with it and Christ with it. The bottom line is a person. Um, let's go back to... Uh to free will. We were discussing a little bit about that before. And I know Dr. Lennox uh, knows a great deal. There are a lot of skeptics and even some believers uh, that say the free will answer to suffering isn't found in the scriptures. In fact, free will isn't found in the scriptures. Um, can we find uh, an, an instance of free will in the Bible, Dr. Lennox? How many would you like? <laughs> now, this is, as you know, He's a rascal, this chap, you see, because this is a huge loaded theological question. But it's a very important question. And when our Lord wept over Jerusalem, just going to the first one I can think of, he said to them how often I would, my will was, to gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. It's a very clear statement that Christ himself believed people had a will and could decide.
Now, it's crucial to biblical theology because it starts right at the beginning of Genesis. The whole story of the fall is meaningless without a certain freedom of will. And I couldn't even begin to understand the gospel. Now, why some um, Christians reject it is a confusion, I think. They imagine that if we were capable of exercising will in trusting God, then we would be earning our own salvation. That is false, and it's demonstrably false because Paul is very careful in the New Testament to point out that faith, whatever it is, is the opposite of works. And Paul tells us several times that Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. Trusting God is not a work. It's like receiving a present at Christmas. You reach out to receive it. You haven't earned it. Now, this is such a huge problem that I've written another book about it. It came out last week, and it's called Determined to Believe? Question mark. And I can't go down that road any further, but it is so important. Let me put it this way. It seems to me that the greatest thing about you as made in the image of God, about you and me, is our capacity to trust. And the issue in the gospel is, are we prepared to use our trust on God and Christ? You see, we trust. I've been married to the same person for nearly 50 years. There's a trust between us. I've got a God-given capacity to trust my fellow humans. I have to trust banks. I have to trust Boeing when I'm flying in planes. I have to trust medics. We've all got the capacity to trust. The big issue is with the gospel, are we prepared to use that capacity to trust God? We're not earning salvation. He provides it. He initiates it. He's the founder of it all. But nothing happens unless I'm prepared to take that step because it's through that trust that relationship uh, grows. But Mark might want to continue on this. I just agree, and I think, I think the whole story of the Bible doesn't make sense if there's not freedom. Um, there are no believers, really, if there's no freedom. I mean, ultimately, it's God choosing to believe through a few people and the other people he chooses not to believe through, which just doesn't make sense. It doesn't square with what, what I read in Scripture. I think the story only makes sense if Adam and Eve really could obey God but chose not to, which is what they did. And I think that comes right down to my life. I think I'm culpable before God. All of us are responsible before God because we have the choice whether to reach out and receive the gracious gift of salvation that Christ paid for on the cross or to reject it. And it's because we have that freedom that we're responsible for what we do with it. And, and it's worth, sorry, no, it's sorry. very worthwhile saying that all our civil legal legislation, the existence of a police force and a judiciary, assumes that we've got freedom and therefore responsibility. Because if Dawkins is right, we don't have freedom. It's very interesting that leading atheists deny freedom. It's sad when Christians do. But our whole civil life depends on responsibility. And to treat a person as not responsible, that's a very risky thing. Because C.S. Lewis wrote about this in a, in a very interesting um, uh, little booklet. Um, what is it called on the case for Christian. Christianity? I think. No, no, it's it's a very short oh, thing. Which book? The one where he deals with capital punishment and things like this. Never mind. Uh, it's no, it's the utilitarian theory of punishment, something like that. And we're moving to that in our society. You're not guilty. You're ill. And therefore, there's no fixed term. You have to wait till the doctors decide whether you're right or wrong. That's immensely difficult. And as you know, it was practiced in parts of the Soviet Union not so long ago. 
So you have to abolish all of that. But it's a huge subject, and unfortunately some believers get quite emotional about it. But we're not going to get emotional because we're probably going to move on from it. I, I just want to say one more thing. It's always interesting to me for someone who doesn't believe in freedom that they will try to change my mind about it. <laughs> As if I have the choice. If, if they're right and everything's determined, then I can't do anything about it. And arguments aren't going to change anyone's mind. Why even write a book or, or make an argument if there's no freedom? I, I think their, their willingness to argue about it betrays the fact that they're wrong. But what about natural disasters, Mark? We, um, free wills, often people say, say yes, that's, uh, that's well and good. But these events, we call them acts of God. How, um, how, can, we, how can we explain this? How can we deal with this? I don't call them acts of God. Um, I think God allows them, but I, I think this all, again, fits with the Christian worldview. Um, you go back to the story in Genesis. First, there was moral evil, and that brought to the judgment on the cosmos that you read about in Genesis 3. We live in a fallen world, and moral evil led to natural evil. And uh, we live in a world that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's why in Romans 8, it says the whole creation is groaning for that moment where you know, Christ will return and the sons of God, the children of God will be revealed. In other words, when God brings his kingdom back and, and makes the, all things right. But in, this, in the meantime, we live in this parentheses period of fallenness and evil where things are not the way they were meant to be, and that includes natural disasters that wreak all kinds of pain and suffering. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. So again, it, it fits with the worldview, the very thing that's taught in Scripture. It's, it's not fair, it's not right, it's not what God intended, but sin brought this about. Thank God he's going to change it. Now, people say if, if, this, if God... If God's really a good God, why doesn't he just end evil now? Why doesn't he just fix things? And uh, someone else said this, but I think it's a good question. They said, if God tonight at midnight decided to end all evil, how many of us would be around to watch Good Morning America tomorrow? Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says it's God's patience that keeps him from ending evil and bringing judgment and restoring all things right now. God's waiting for some of us or some of our friends, some of our family members to repent. And so that's why he allows things to keep going and for there to be suffering because he's waiting till the full measure of uh, people that are going to come to him do and then he'll finally bring the end. And now I'm preaching. Do you want to preach? Oh, I always want to preach. <laughs> it's very interesting that in two major places in Scripture, the two kinds of problem, natural evil, moral evil, are linked. And this will give you something to think about. The book of Job at the beginning, you remember what happened? We see behind the scenes where God allows Satan to attack Job. And messengers come one day and say that the Chaldeans have fallen upon your sons and so many people are killed. That's moral evil. The very next one is fire comes from heaven. That's natural evil. And then there's another raiding party. That's moral evil. And then there's a great wind. That's natural evil. And in the New Testament, in Luke, our Lord is in the temple, and he says, do you think that the people whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices were sinners above all other sinners? No, he said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he said, or do you think that the people on whom the tower of Siloam fell were sinners above all? And you see here again, Pilate, that was moral evil. The tower falling, that's natural evil. They're very closely connected in Scripture. 
but they are separate conceptually. That's point one. Point number two. I arrived in New Zealand the week of the earthquake. And I was programmed a whole schedule of lectures and I had to change them all. The only question on people's minds were earthquakes, why? And if you Google my name in New Zealand, you can see those talks. Possibly the most useful one was one I held in a Baptist church with the biggest congregation they'd seen for many years in Christchurch, less than a week after the earthquake happened. And oddly, before I came to New Zealand, I'd been reading a book on plate tectonics, just because I'm interested in lots of things. And I discovered that... I, I did that for my devotions this morning. <laughs> I didn't mean that kind of plate. Um, <laughs> plate tectonics, that's how the crust of the earth has built these huge floating plates. Now these two authors were writing this book and pointing out if the earth didn't have those plates, there would be no human beings on it because their movement is absolutely essential for life. Now this compounds the difficulty, doesn't it? What is the thing that is wrong here? Well, it's not the plates. There'd be no humans about it. The problem is that we build houses above the fault lines. Now, of course, you may not know that the fault lines are there. But now the question comes again, and it's exactly the same question as before. Could God not have made a physical planet without plates? Could he not have made fire that warmed but never burned? Could he not have made electricity that's never dangerous? Could he, could he, could he? We don't know the answer to any of those questions, do we? We're faced with barbed wire and beauty, or we're faced with, in this context, tsunamis and beautiful scenery. And again, it seems to me, the question is virtually identical. We see all that, and we have to ask, is there any evidence that there's a God with whom we could trust it in the end? Because I tell you something, I'm going to go into eternity with many questions, and so are you. And they'll not all be resolved. You know, I think, some years ago, I was within nanoseconds of a heart attack. And when they fixed my heart, the doctor said very nicely, he said, you should be dead. Oh, I said, thank you very much. Well, he said, I don't understand why you're not dead, but you haven't had a heart attack and you can go home. And people say, isn't that wonderful? Did you thank the Lord for it? And I said, yes, but just think about this. At the same time, my sister's daughter, my niece, age 22, just married to a youth pastor, had an earthquake in her brain, a tumor, and she died. Should my sister thank God for that? We can be very insensitive when we're talking about our gratitude to God. And we need to be so careful because of people hurting. And that's why I say, ultimately, is there a God that we can trust with it? And that is where we need to speak about what Mark hinted at. If Jesus had remained on the cross, there would be no hope. That would end up in atheism. Absolutely no hope. But the thing that changes everything is the resurrection from the dead. That changes everything. Because it means death isn't the, the end. <coughs> and that gives us huge hope of a restoration. See, the striking thing is when even God's son was on earth, there was one lame man at the temple as they went up to worship. And he healed the lame man, but there were thousands of others. He didn't heal them. But the apostles explained that Jesus must go to heaven 
until the time of restoration of all things. It's not yet. And so we are in the in-between. But there's enough evidence through the resurrection, the ascension, and the cross to say, well, I can't solve it all. But I believe I can really trust God with it. And you know, I talked about that in New Zealand. I didn't know there was a lady there sitting and a wall had collapsed on her husband and he was dead. She left before I was finished, but she left me a note. And the note said, that's the first glimmer of hope I've begun to see. Real, it's, it's, it's interesting. You've, you mentioned Peter Creeve. Uh, he, um, he made an observation that most objections to the existence of God from the problem of suffering come from outside observers who are quite comfortable, whereas those who actually suffer are as often as not made into stronger believers by their suffering. I was wondering if you could comment why, why that is. Do you, do you agree with that observation? Well, yeah, I think that suffering, again, talking about Romans 8, 28, how God does bring good out of bad, uh, doesn't make the suffering good in and of itself. But when you're suffering, it brings you back to reality. You know, when, when everything's happy and glib and, you know, life's just a party, we forget about God and we, we forget about what's important. We forget about eternity. Um, I had a neighbor just... Uh, get cancer a month ago and he died just a couple days ago well that wasn't my suffering but it was a friend of mine and it brings me back to reality it's back you know we live in a very short time period here on earth and what really ultimately matters is eternity um, it's, it's you know James says your life is like a, a mist and I think suffering brings us back to that reality that life is short that what ultimately matters is not, you know, a new car or a new promotion or some big vacation. It's being right with the God who made me, knowing I'm forgiven, that I'm his child, and that I'm going to be with him for all of eternity, and that I can trust him, as Dr. Lennox said. And I think suffering uh, for all of the pain and all the things we want to avoid, that is a good God can bring out of it if we will cooperate with and trust him. Would you, would you agree with uh, Mr. Kreeft, Dr. Lennox? I would because that's been my experience of, of talking to people. You read books by Joni Erickson, Tada, for instance. But I will never forget sitting with a group of young people one of whom had Down syndrome, and quite obviously so, were sitting around. And we were talking, and this young man was quite articulate, though he had difficulty talking. He was very intelligent. And suddenly, in the middle of our conversation, he said this. He said, you know, some people look at me, and they say, why? And my reply to them is, why not? And I just, and the others there, just started to weep. You know, the lad's faith in God was so real because he knew that one day he was going to have a new body. That is a tremendous thing to be able to tell people who are psychologically injured or physically injured. Atheism doesn't have that. Atheism is a hopeless faith, and it is a faith. Actually, it's sheer credulity. But Christianity offers hope of utter transformation. And when I think of Christians who have not only suffered physically, but been abused, that saddest of sufferings, and have had to live for it for years, the thought of having a new body at the resurrection is a fantastic thing. Atheism can't compete with this. And we ought to realize it. And that brings me to something that you maybe wanted to mention, Nick, but I'm going to flag it up 
All of the talk so far has left out the suffering caused by atheism, which is vast. More rivers of blood have flowed in the 20th century than all other centuries put together. And Richard Dawkins loves to sing John Lennon's song, Imagine a World Without Religion. Do you know that song? Well, you may notice I am not John Lennon, I'm John Lennox. <laughs> and I've written a song. It's called Imagine. Imagine a world without Stalin. Imagine a world without Pol Pot or Mao Zedong. Without the killing fields. What about that world? We never hear a mention of it. And after 9-11, there appeared in the equivalent of Time magazine in Germany, Der Spiegel, the mirror, in the front page had a picture of the Twin Towers, and over it was the inscription, Gott ist an allem schuld, God's to blame for everything. And pages and pages and pages of this. And I thought, what a distorted reading of history. Atheism is to blame. And when I lecture in these things in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, Russia, and Poland, and so on, and tell them of Dawkins' view, they just say, bring about here. And we'll show them what it was really like. Church after church destroyed, pastors, priests murdered, and all this kind of thing. This needs to be mentioned. And at the same time, there needs to be mentioned the vast amount of good that has come from Christianity. Our universities, our hospitals, our hospices, our civil legislation, our education, all of that flowing out of the Christian faith. We need to get this thing into proportion on the global scale. But you didn't ask me that question, so I'll say no more about it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Middleberg and Dr. John Lennox.